please, what is that? Don't tell me. It's on the reflexes. You're listening to All in the Reflexes, an unrepentant vivisection of geek news and culture. It's on the reflexes. With the comedy rock geek Mikey Mason, the Brack of all trades, Jeb Brack, Madison Matricula Roberts, and Tech Guy Steve. Song Reflex. I know there's a problem with your face. Hi, welcome to All in the Reflexes. I am your host, Madison Matricula Roberts, with. Tech guy Steve, and uh, it's it's just us today, but that's all right. We don't need those men. <laughs> yeah, this isn't their day. <laughs> it's International Women's Day, uh, coming out of the um, labor movement. Uh, there's also a really there was also a really really cute Google Doodle today with uh, some inspirational artwork. Always love the Google Doodles. So yeah, this one was a, was pretty um uh, involved. I mean, it had a, a a bunch of art stories and you could, you know, choose one at a time and go through them. Um, all in different styles from different parts of the world. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Like different, different art styles and different stories. And I'm sure you can uh, see the videos from it on YouTube after this. Yep. But and they are archived somewhere. I don't know where, but if you Google it, <laughs> <laughs> get it. Um, but there is a whole page of all the previous Google doodles. They save them. I always like the ones that are the interactive games. Yes. <laughs> I, I like right. those a lot. Well, what what has been going on in your life, Steve? Uh, we had nine inches of snow last night. <laughs> oh, uh, oh no! Uh, and th- so we had the big giant uh, windstorm, you know, a week ago. Now we've had nine inches of snow and more powerful winds knocking down trees. And then I think we're going to have something else next week. And so, wow. what's that? What's that old saying about the um, march in like a lion, out like a lamb? <laughs> Is that I, what nor nor'easters are? Yes, yeah, we get hit the okay. three nor'easters. Um, you know, these powerful winds as the weather is driven out to sea. Um, so I started this morning first thing behind a snowblower, <laughs> and the <laughs> snow was heavy and wet and miserable. But we got everything cleared and um, whatever. But what I'm excited about is not the damn snow in New England. <laughs> I'm excited because I got to go see a, a movie called Annihilation. Um, it's a, it's. But it's a beautiful movie. It stars Natalie Portman and others, but she's the the main headliner. Um, and it's really, really good, high quality science fiction. And we don't really get that much of it on the screen. And then there's this whole thing, you know, you could read the news, but it's about the distribution deal. The studio didn't really think it would sell, and so they wanted him to make changes, so the director didn't want to. So the first thing they did is cut their international distribution, and it goes straight to Netflix everywhere but North America. Oh, weird. Yeah. I think there was some, like, something weird going on with it. Like, the studio wasn't really convinced it was exactly marketable. And so but... it went to theaters here in North America, but they spent almost nothing promoting it. No, uh, the only way I knew about it was, was trailers on, on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, I got to see it in the theater. It was beautiful. It was psychedelic. It's strange. And it's it really leaves you thinking quite a bit about what... The theme was, you know, what it's referring. Anyways, if you guys get a chance, see it, Annihilation. Probably by the time this comes out, it won't be in theaters anymore. It's only going to be out there for a week or two. But it will be available through other means, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, apparently on Netflix soon. So Yeah. Well, on that note, let's move on to the news. And now for some more bad news. Ready? MASH star David Ogden... Steers died at 75. You probably know him as Major Charles Winchester, the kind of uh, stuffy but you know kind-hearted uh, doctor in Mash. I think the um, uh, later season. Did you ever watch Mash? Are you familiar with Mash at all? I I remember it being in syndication when I was growing up. Um, yep, me but, too. Like, so I've seen some reruns of it, but not not a significant amount. I mean, like my parents would always watch it, and it was like okay, yeah. The same thing. Saw it in syndication on and off for years and years and years. So I was definitely familiar with the um, with the characters and the change up. And like uh, most of the country, I made sure to watch the last episode. It, at the time, it was one of the most watched uh, hours of TV ever when that series finally went off the air. So anyways, uh, we have the passing of, of, a, of a pretty good actor, this uh, David Ogden Steers. Well, in lighter news, sort of hi- historical stuff... Barbie has modeled some dolls after um, 
some of these NASA hidden figure uh, women, uh, Catherine Johnson in specifics, but also some other uh, feminist icons. Uh, I think there's a Frida Kahlo and a few uh, a few others. The dolls look great, actually. I thought there's so, a too. Lot. Kind they of actually, a like, period-appropriate dress and hairstyle. Yeah, and, and they seem to have uh, paid a lot of det- attention to having different facial molds. Mm-hmm. Also, um, even looking at the uh, the Catherine Johnson one, all of the, like, accessories are so on point she's even got like a little um lab badge yeah and the lanyard in the badge i love it love it Uh, and of course those cat eye glasses (laughs) so i i always like i mean like barbie you know some of it's 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 always it's a consumer-based thing and it's always a little bit fraught but i do like a lot of their specialty dolls they're really really cool so Oh, I actually like I, I not I don't collect Barbies, but I, I actually collect dolls. So I have lots of like Madame Alexander dolls, and it just reminded me I'm, I'm I, I need to bring them all back from my parents' house. And I have a few of the specialty Barbies, but I'm really into dolls. Like I love their dead glass eyes. So. <laughs> so, but these actually have nice you, expressions. You so put them on a shelf, fit. have them watch you while you record, and judgment yeah, well, watch need, you in judgment. I need several cabinets of them actually because i have like um i have like two two big display cabinets it's my my pride richard's not so crazy about it but (laughs) that's okay (laughs) so speaking of cold dead eyes right off of his oscar win jordan peele is talking about um bringing a series directly to hbo based on a novel called lovecraft lovecraft country so it it seems to be pretty far along they have a director Chosen, it's going to be, I believe, a limited series on HBO based on an award-winning novel also called Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. Um, And it happens in, like, uh, let's see. The 50s? Yeah. Embark on a road trip across 1950s Jim Crow America and the the struggle to survive and overcome both the racist terrors of white America and terrifying monsters that could have been ripped right out of Lovecraft's paperbacks. (laughs) That's not a subtle contrast there, but that sounds amazing. Yeah, I wonder if they have to work on a metaphor. Do you think there's a metaphor there somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't read the book. I've heard of it before. It's It's been yeah. on my, like, tangential to read list. Um, yeah, it's been on my Amazon recommended yeah. list for quite a while. But <laughs> for a while, yeah. That would be a that would be a, a fun uh, episode to have. Just recommended books that we have never read and what we think they're about. <laughs> and why we think Amazon keeps recommending them. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure whatever happens, I mean, HBO's probably they have a pretty good track record. So uh, mm-hmm. I think they could do a lot with that. Talking about Amazon recommendations, uh, some other technology stuff, uh, Oculus, uh, which is owned by uh, Facebook. Somebody screwed up really bad today. Yeah. There was some kind of expired security certificate that has soft bricked all of the Rift VR headsets. <laughs> so um, people are, uh, they just, they, they just are not working. There's just some some minor update, it sounds like, and uh, you might know more about like the techie parts of it. Yeah. But, uh, What's really started... bugging people is it's not clear how to fix it because because <laughs> of this problem, the headsets cannot contact the Rift website. So there, people have been asking in the forums and Facebook and Twitter, like, I, I don't get it. How are you going to push a, an update down if nobody can talk to you? <laughs> So. I don't know. <laughs> this is we're in. Hey, listen, we are in the wild west. Like. Yes. Uh, there's there's all kinds of weird stuff happening these days. So yeah, I think this is the part of the Wild West in which the cowboy's horse gets drunk and passes out in the feed bin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the part we were hoping for. Yeah, it refuses to horse. Right. Yeah. yeah. So these these headsets just refuse to refuse to work. So, how, yeah. but I don't know. Like I can see how like things like this get overlooked, but it yep. does also just seem like that's a huge sweeping like black mirror style thing like you know yeah that's right um yeah exactly it's it's somebody's job somewhere and they overlooked it and i know it's not the sexiest part of tech work is to make sure all your uh, certificates get updated and pushed out you know every couple years but man does stuff break when you don't do it (laughs) i think we're gonna have more of this they keep talking about this internet of things it's looking all these connected devices and this is exactly the kind of problem those things can have you know, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden your refrigerator can no longer talk to GE or whatever because somebody forgot to renew a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I so like in my house, like I have um, Nest thermostats, Hue mm-hmm. lights, Sonoses, even my, um, I have a meat thermometer that's Bluetooth. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I hope it cooks my chicken, you know. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, so. Let's keep this technology train rolling. Uh, Mark choo, Wahlberg's choo. been trying to make uh, the Bionic Man a reboot for years. Um, he had to update the price. The original was called The Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> but that's when the book was written in the, I want to say the 50s. Um, yeah. The book is much older than TV series. Me and my brother watched that series like mad. And then my parents got us the doll. They had a little Steve Austin doll. And it was cool. Like it had a, you could push a spot on its back and his bionic arm would ratchet up, you know, click, click, <laughs> click, click, click. But it didn't make the sound. And so my brother and I would constantly do it ourselves. We'd be hitting the button going, na 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 Drove my parents nuts. <laughs> they regretted getting us that damn toy. As someone who's never never seen it, I, I really did enjoy your um, theatrical react- reenactment. <laughs> reenactment. I, I understand. <laughs> like, I totally can picture every bit <laughs> yeah. of that. Um, and they, they had it a couple years ago. I'm sure it's still around somewhere, but on one of those, like, retro channels on cable. So I sat down to watch it, and the first thing that struck me was, oh, geez, Louise, man, he's wearing like these full body, um, but like action suits thing. It, it's like a top and bottom, you know, that are one piece, like a one piece. Like <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, with bell bottoms, super wide collar, an integrated belt, all in kind of this uh, mauve color. <laughs> it's just like. I'm imagining wow. like a like Elvisy evil Knievel jumpsuit. Yes, is that, yes, that's is that it. what it is? Okay. Uh, it was, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what those are called. <laughs> um, so apparently, Wahlberg's been having trouble. It's been going on and off for years, um, but but supposedly he's worked out whatever the last kinks are. Warner Brothers is distributing it. It's going to be called the Six Billion Dollars Man, and it's supposedly coming out um, May thirty first, twenty nineteen. So I don't really know. I mean, it's got the nostalgia thing. Um, and it's a cool idea. Bionics and stuff is a cool idea. And I don't know what they're going to do with it's it. It's still but... cool. I mean, like, it's very, like, I mean, they could, like, cyberpunk it up a little bit more. And it'd probably be, like, near future cyberpunky stuff. I, that could I bet be you really that's cool. what they're going to do. Yeah. yeah. But again, they're, they're, on the other hand, why did it take up so long? That's usually not a great sign when the yeah. studio is kind of sitting on a project. And, and again, it around. And... More tech news is... uh. A, a Chinese competitor to Google named uh, Beidou has announced an upgrade to their text-to-speech application, which they're calling Deep Voice. And uh, supposedly, instead of taking half an hour or longer to analyze a person's voice and then replicate it, the system could do it in less than a minute. No. Less than a minute. You feed it in the example voice, usually from recordings, and within a minute, it's figured out the um, texture and pattern. Then you can type anything you want, and it will say it in the voice that you taught it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Isn't my gosh, that so... crazy? Yeah, no. Because I remember, I remember, like, there, there was an NPR piece about this kind of technology a while ago, but it, it was like the, the old school, like, old school, like, six months ago, where it took time. Yep. <laughs> And and now it's like I mean just almost instantly. This is like something out of um, uh, what's that uh, cruise uh, Mission Impossible? It's sounds like some gadget a spy would oh, yeah. have in a Mission Impossible movie, where you record the you know the target's voice, and then a couple minutes later you're talking with that target's exact speech pattern or whatever, and tricking people. Oh, yeah. It's going to make things weird because people still take orders and such over the phone. And so if you could uh, effortlessly imitate, for example, a movie star or a famous athlete and call the press, um, like how would they know? Even somebody who knows you may not be able to pick up that this is a synthetic voice, you know? Yeah. I mean, I hear people like I, I, I listen to like a lot of YouTube and like I hear people with voices that have sounded so similar to mine already mm-hmm. that I like had to double check it wasn't one of my videos, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like seriously, like um, I'll have to I'll have to link the, the one it's like her voice just sounds exactly like mine, even to me, which I just think is bizarre. But it's like the, all this stuff with like the. The, the way we can fake, uh, like, the voices and um, the stuff that's been going around about, like, the deep fake, like, yep. pornography and, like, video stuff. It's like we really are kind of moving into this post-truth era. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> like Where it'll become again, harder and harder to tell the difference. Yeah, like, man, I mean, we really are. This is like Black Mirror Day. <laughs> it is. Well, since I am often afraid of the coming robot apocalypse, I'm going to switch topics to the Star Wars. So remember... um what was it a few months ago Disney announced that they were going to be leaving Netflix so that means all the Marvel content that's not joint with Netflix and yeah. all the Disney movies were going to go to their own distribution platform so like Disneyplex or whatever they're going to call it yeah 
they've scheduled uh, John Favreau to produce and write a live action Star Wars theory- series. There's no release date yet, and there's not much known about the show. But for I mean, probably at least a decade, I've uh, and this is like pre Lucas Arts or, or yep. um, before uh, the Disney buyout. Right, but they were always trying to pitch a live action show, and um, Disney, I think, has the muscle and cash to do it. I- and I'm timid about it because, like, I think it would be awesome to have a live action Star Wars show because, like, I love fan fiction, so I am great with like canon fiction and my head canon. Everything can exist simultaneously, and I'm good with that because um, their animated shows for kids have been excellent. Like Star Wars Rebels just wrapped. That is excellent and um clone wars was always really well received as well so i have optimistic feelings uh will i pay for the disney distributions platform to see it i don't know yeah <laughs> you know it's i don't know probably if it's enough to be, suck me in yeah like it's probably going to be somewhere between like seven and ten dollars a month if i had to guess based on the other ones and they certainly have enough content it might even be more like that's probably a conservative estimate yeah you know? So, I don't know. On the other hand, yeah. uh, Favreau's did excellent work with the uh, first Iron Man movie. Um, I think he was also in it. The first couple Iron Man movies were Favreau. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I also would like to know what it's going to do. Is It's not going to explore the main characters, I hope, because we still have if, all the, the yeah. movie trilogies coming. But is it going to like fill out the universe, tell us what's going on outside the Rebel Alliance and outside the First Order and or oh, the yes, Empire? Yes, please. Exactly. How many Canto I think Bite there's... episodes can we get in? I'm in. Exactly, yeah. Yes, leave the main characters alone and tell us side stories. <laughs> no, no, the the main characters, it's just all Broom Boy. All Broom Boy in his pants. <laughs> That's right, Broom Boy. Uh, so, I have read some Terry Pratchett, not all of them, um, but I definitely read Good Omens, which is a co-written by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. They've been talking about making that into a movie or something for a long time. It's a very well-loved book. Really crazy, cool ideas. Um, I, I, have you familiar with it at all? No, can you can you give me like a quick plot synopsis? Yeah, um, there's a demon and an angel who are waiting for the apocalypse, but they've kind of settled in and have a really good life, and they they're very happy with the way things are. So when the Antichrist shows up and the end of this coming, they kind of conspire to keep it from happening. And again, it's literally like we like things the way they are. Like one of them collects books and drinks his tea and. I don't want to ruin that, you know? Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so they deliberately mess with the Antichrist so that he ends up in a, in the wrong family and the whole plot of evil rising, whatever fails, but not because they're trying to save the world, just because trying to maintain status quo, they, they <laughs> like the world as it is. Um, and I'm not, I'm not even doing it justice, but that's kind so of it's, the, it's funny. Yes, it, it definitely, it has, it's serious, but with a lot of humor and it, exactly the kind of humor I love is kind of, um, uh, where they're playing with uh, the you know kind of the Christian mythos. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, the news is is that uh, Parks and Rec star Nick Offerman is going to join Amazon's production of Good Omens. Oh. So uh, they say they're building it for BBC. I don't know if that means it's going to end up on the Amazon streaming Who's app. Or cast in that they had huh? the two leads, right? Cast. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. I no, no, uh, I think David you're right. Yep. And Michael Sheen. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's, it sounds really cool. I hope that I get to watch it on Amazon, you know, Prime Streaming. Mm-hmm. But they keep talking about this, you know, BBC, BBC, so. Um, Hard to say. I don't know. And, and in other Terry Pratchett news, his Discworld series is, is going to be made into a TV series, also for the BBC. So a Discworld is an entire series of books. Unfortunately, I think I only maybe read one. I didn't read them all. Pratchett was a very mm-hmm. prolific writer. He had a lot of stuff in a connected world. So, like, all these books were connected somehow, and, um, but, uh, Discworld fans, you know, again, Amazon is producing it, and they're producing it for BBC, so. That's awesome. Yeah. I did read, um, I did read, uh, not, not Hogfather, uh, what's the one with the, the tourist, Color of Magic, ah. I really liked, and there was a, um, a BBC miniseries with Sean Astin, it was very cute. Cool. Yeah, that's most of my experience with <laughs> Terry with Pratchett. Pratchett. I know yeah. I, I liked it. I just there's just so yeah. much stuff. To Sir read, Terry, so. Sir Terry, Sir, you're right. Yeah, the late, he, the late Sir the Terry. Late, yes, he. Had, there were a lot of cool stories about him. He, um, he actually had a sword forged out of a meteorite. Um, oh, cool. uh, yeah, he was able <laughs> of to find one <laughs> and takes it. Yeah, take it to someone to have it forged. Um, he also got permission after he was knighted to create his own a coat of arms. 
And so he's got his own personal coat of arms. I think he's a very cool guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's some good news. Well, let's move on to some trailer trashing. This will make for one epic trailer. So uh, we talked before about Lost in Space, and it, mm-hmm. at the time they'd only released a teaser. And I think our consensus was, nah, you know, wait and see, whatever. Yeah. But um, they've now released the first official trailer, and I don't know, what did you think? I It did look much more exciting. I don't know what's all going on with the robot. Exactly. Uh, so, like, and I don't, this is not, but this is in the, the teaser trailer. So, the, the robot is not with them originally. Yeah. They find the robot on the planet, and it's, I don't know what his deal is. No, but, they uh, don't seem to know either. He seems to be of alien construction. But yeah. he bonds with, you know, Will Robinson. Will. Yeah. And so, there's this great big dangerous looking hulking robot. And this little boy, you know? Yeah, the and creature kind of... design on that robot looked good to me, though. Amazing. Very good. So, like, it's kind of, like, got this, um, it's like a strong slender y kind of thing. Yeah. With like, not, with, like, a big head. So it looks like it would be, like, dangerous. Yeah. But then he's got this, like, vacuous f- faceplate that's, like, got lights that seem like they go infinitely back it was very like a starfield, but like yep. like hyperspace starfieldy stuff. It was very cool, actually. I'm very impressed by that. Yeah, me too. I, I thought um, they finally showed Doctor Smith again. We mentioned it. It's played by Parker Posey, so they're gender mm-hmm. swapping that role. And the, she's only in a few seconds of the trailer. She looks weird. I don't know if it, if the makeup is weird, if the lighting was weird. She doesn't look her usual self. And I, again, they didn't really show us enough to help us understand what her role is in the film. Um, yeah, in the original, uh, Smith was a saboteur and stuck aboard and accidentally was launched with the ship. Oh, and he um, was such a slimy jerk, too. Exactly. He always He's kind of rat. menacing, dangerous. Rat. Yeah. I want to see if they can keep that up with Parker Posey. I, I would like to see, I always like to see, like, women getting a chance, if they do also play it, like, just slimy, Villains. Frenchy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, not like, oh, I'm a cold, haughty lady villain. It's like, no, I'm a rat you yeah know, like a rat person <laughs> she's got a huge range but she usually does pretty lighthearted stuff mm-hmm. so i think so, this will be a, a big difference for parker posey yeah which i'd like to see a lot of people that have good comedic timing also have really good dramatic timing because it's, yeah. it's so much about beats and timing and uh i don't know i'm excited now what about this uh this new <laughs> this other trailer <sighs> christopher robin uh, you may recognize him as the little boy who played with winnie the pooh in the hundred acre woods um uh, so i have Okay, so like six months ago or something, they had a, another Christopher Robin movie oh. um, that was uh, about like it was uh, it wasn't there was no fantastical element. Oh, it was oh, just it was almost like based on the real story of yes, the boy, yes, the father, bio-picky, and the toys. Yes, biopicky kind of as he's growing up and how hard it was for him to be Christopher Robin uh, once he got to uh, boarding school where boys are awful. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. As as you can imagine. So um so before we get it, so I was reading more about this and Christopher Christopher Robin Milne had such a troubled relationship with his especially with his mother, but he also like was always really really uncomfortable with Winnie the Pooh being commercialized and mm. didn't like how he was kind of always in this shadow until he was like m- later in life. He died in 96, I think. So, coming into that, so we had the biopic one. This one is much more a romanticized, feel-good kind of story about an adult Christopher Robin who has lost his way and needs to spend more time with his family because he's torn between that and like his and a, his job in London. Yeah, it's corporate. They have, yes. of course, like every evil corporation, they want him to lay off the workforce. And what will he do? Cut twenty percent. Cut twenty. He's like, well, what does he say? What to do? What to do? And then he hears a voice behind him. And it's poo. It's poo. And uh, the CGI actually looks good on. It the, doesn't look um, like that horrible uh, soul sucking monstrosity, which was Woody Woodpecker. No, 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 no. This is a, a so the CGI. So it's um, it's definitely like a stuffed bear with like the little like gund like curly fur kind of yeah, stuff. Kind of like C- button eyes, sort of. Yeah, yeah. It uh, the CGI actually looked good and not terrifying because like. If you really think about stuffed animals, like, just starting to, like, talk and stuff, like, a lot of the, the proportions are such, it would just be, like, 
terrifying. <laughs> That's right. Um, so they did actually really well on the design for it, I think. So, but I don't know. Like, I always feel a little weird. Like, the same thing with, like, those movies about um jm barry the guy that wrote peter pan yep i always feel a little weird about like romanticized bio like not bio so, but, like, so romanticized. I. so i don't know like yeah, I, how would he because feel there about is it? a reality here and they're kind of um obscuring it with this made up you know garbage yeah. yeah it's like um this is another thing so um that that just an aside that that musical that came out the greatest showman yes like, over the holidays like so one it's a very like whether you liked it or not too and i love music movie musicals so like that's not a thing but it's like whether or not you they kind of like whitewash his like exploitive racist history but the thing is like the greatest showman was so divorced from any history why did it have to be about pt barnum it could have been about any flim flam bamboozler showman yeah what what was the point of basing on a real person if you're not going to tell any part of the story correctly yeah yeah, and in fact, like, so that's this is kind of, I don't know, like, in this case, it does kind of, if you're going to use Winnie the Pooh, it does kind of have to be like a Christopher Robin thing, or you're going to get into like a Ted territory, <laughs> Yeah, maybe? that's right. We don't want that. No, no, I mean, not for this, and I don't ever, but I, I'm no arbiter of taste, so... Cool. So I don't know. Let the you, listeners, you can decide. Um, are these trailers trashed or touted? <laughs> or um, I, I think I'm happy with the first one and not as happy with Christopher Robin. Yeah, but again, one, one I also don't these... have kids to take to the theater, so that's no, that's true too. I mean, but, but again, what, does your kid want to care about corporate layoffs? I mean, is that really the <laughs> like your eight year old is going to talk about the spreadsheets? And get... <laughs> they, they might now. I mean, I don't yeah, know. Right. I haven't been around kids in a while. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do I know? Uh, hey, have you been playing any games recently? I have. Big fun. Small price. So I've rediscovered a game that I used to play a lot of. It is called World of Goo. It is a building physics puzzler. So like you, you build structures to to reach goals, and the the puzzles that you have to solve by doing so get progressively harder. And the structures themselves, themselves, like you have to be careful about weight, and there's wind sometimes. So that's that's a really cool thing. It's by 2D Boy Games. It was released in 2008, so this is a 10 year old game. Yeah, I remember. I remember the big news when it came out. It, it caused a big stir. Was it independent? Was yes, it one of those it kind was, of independent yes, was, games that had a huge um, following that kind of surprised everybody? Yes, it was one of the first, um, especially like uh, through the Steam distribution platform. It was one of the first indie games that was like a viral sensation. Okay. Uh, so it's available basically on all platforms now: Steam for Windows and Mac, uh, and even mobile devices uh, for i i um, iPhone and Android. And uh, I think it's ten bucks on Steam for a PC or Mac version, and five bucks for the mobile version. Okay, so there's 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 a story here. Oh, okay. So it's you are there's okay, it's it's really weird. So there's a really distinctive art style, but basically there's this goo corporation that is taking over these rolling green hills with their industrial machinations. Okay. And you are like helping the goo balls kind of escape sort of by building these structures and helping them reach a pipe that sucks them all the way, which also <laughs> translates to points for you. Okay. But what makes it really endearing is that there's the, the the narrator, such as it is, is the sign painter. So at the start of a bunch of levels, or if there's a new challenge or new information or a new kind of goo ball to make a structure, they uh, the sign, there's a little sign and you like a wooden painted sign and you click on the sign and there's like kind of like a sarcastic snarky (laughs) message on the sign and you click through and so that's how the game communicates to you okay that's cool but mostly it is so much fun to build these little structures and some of them you have to make towers other times you have to like span a gap without your thing tumbling over into the gap uh or sometimes you have to make like a wheel and roll it but it's hard to describe but it's a lot of fun and it's good for all ages plus with the mobile version uh, which I haven't played around with some, but I watched some videos on it. The gameplay is really similar because it's all mouse-based, so it translates really well to a touchscreen. Cool. 
yeah. So I um I played a little bit of it. Uh, I have a YouTube video of some of the the gameplay from it. But you can find lots of let's plays, and I actually really really recommend it. So I um I remembered the game because I was looking through. I bought a humble bundle like oh, last okay. year, and I'd already I already owned World of Goo, but World of Goo was one of the games included in the humble bundle. So then I, I was like looking at games that are like, oh, I should play some of these. And then I was like, oh, I have an extra code for this. But like, oh, man, I really like that game. I should go play that. So I loaded it back up and here I am. So I, I spent like probably like an hour of time I didn't have today just like playing with the little goo balls. And they make really cute noises. They kind of like go, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> like, bloop, bloop, bloop. they're very cute. So highly recommend. A lot of people have probably played it or heard about it. And it is it is good as all the hype. So cool. World of goo. World of Goo. Well, that's what I've been playing. Steve, what have you been watching? Steve is anime. What weird anime is Steve watching this week? Darker than black. Uh, which would have described my poetry back when I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> all, I think all of us go through yeah. that. Darkness of our soul phase. Or at least we thought so. The yeah. the gritty, you know, mid-America, yeah. what do you call it? Uh, I forgot, <laughs> what is before high school? Middle school. Middle school, yeah. It was a gritty middle you. schooler. Um, so this is actually a, a series of series. The first one was called Darker Than Black, The Black Contractor. And the mm -hmm. one I'm watching is a sequel called Darker Than Black, Gemini of the Meteor. Um, pretty dramatic titles. It is <sighs> yes. a crazy idea. Um, so here's what you actually see. <laughs> okay. It's, um, people acquire strange abilities and the abilities come with, um, really weird compulsions, which is their quote contract. And then the government snatch these people up and use them as secret agents, spies, and saboteurs. And mm -hmm. so the governments don't want these people running around on their own because they're too powerful. And, um, so, so they kind of recruit them and train them to be, um, like the high power spies, you know, like I said, assassins and saboteurs. Um, and apparently there is some group that, that wants to operate outside of any kind of government control and they're referred to as the syndicate. It, it's a, a, you know, like a self-organized group of contractors, um, that have their own plan, which we don't, we don't really know about. Dun, dun, dun. The, the weird part is like, um, we don't have access to the sky anymore. And so like the, the moon is no longer visible. The stars in the sky are not real stars. Um, which they never explain what that means. It's just what they keep saying. If it con every star is now tied to a contractor, then if mm -hmm. the contractor dies, the star falls out of the sky. So it's a very dramatic thing. Yeah. But also, no explanation for what any of that stuff means. So um, I've actually seen um, a few. I have not seen the whole series. I've seen a few episodes of this when Richard was watching it, and uh, when you started describing it, I was like, I know, I know what that is. The the, the compulsions that they have to perform yes. to. To, to pay for the act the the superpower that they they engage in um was it is it the main the main character in one of the series has to like dog ear the pages and books or something or yeah and, and they're not yeah. related to the abilities at all but they're strange one some woman who's this thing. like cold-hearted assassin um after using her abilities has to go and bake a cake <laughs> of course she does <laughs> um, it and, is and, still an anime yeah um another girl has to fold paper cranes mm -hmm. Uh, there's one man who has to reveal how a stage magician's trick works. So he has to oh. explain how the trick works, and then he can use his power. Um, it's just weird stuff, man. But yeah, but it sounds funny when you say it that way, but like in the series, it is it's super dead serious. dramatic. Yeah. yeah. And they, they actually do play it seriously, and it is serious. Um, yeah. and it doesn't come off as goofy. It, it seems kind of um, uncomfortable and tragic. It is. And it can display like, th like this bizarre compulsion. Yeah. The, the part that's, that's, at least to me, that causes the most tragedy is that, um, it, it seems to strike randomly. They've, they've never explained why certain people get it and some people don't. But they become like these unemotional, hyper rational, and, um, lethal. And, and so, like in the current series I'm watching, you know, there's this childhood friend who becomes you know, this girl and the boy confesses his love for her and she's blushing and she's bashful and, and then it happens to her and all of a sudden she's this cold hearted, I don't care. I have a mission. You're stopping me from my mission. And, like no feeling whatsoever. Another character, um, th th there's like a boy who's constantly searching for his mother. And it turns out his mother became a contractor um, oh, when he no. was a child and just got up and left. 
And so during the series, a little bit of a spoiler, like he, he finds his mother and he's like saying like, mom, mom, you're back. Like we can have this, you know, reconciliation. And she has absolutely zero interest, nothing like, like her, her attachment to family mean nothing. Um, and that's the part that that's like heartbreaking that, um, these people are people. They're embedded in a, in a culture with, you know, family and friends and, you know, whatever. And all that gets severed for them to become these kind of, um, super agents, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a weird idea that the, the story starts in Russia. A lot of the titles are in Russian. Um, but, but the language is all Japanese and it was, it's obviously a Japanese produced, um, anime. Mm-hmm. So that's something worth, if you're interested, that kind of uh, spies with supernatural elements. The part about the contracts literally seems like something out of a tabletop role-playing game. Yeah, You have does. to choose a, um, a, a, yeah, a, yeah, a, 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 a comp- for complication yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. What a weird idea to put it into a, a TV series. Um, yeah. And, so and, and darker and than black. Yeah, executed not as a laugh thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this exactly. is angsty anime. This is, this is back to basics, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, with that, uh, I think that has been a, a fun episode. So, you know, you can find us on multiple places on the internet and support us on Patreon for as little as a dollar of the month to get double the uncensored content. Uh, Steve, you want to tell the good people a little bit more about that? Yep. We always direct everyone to our website, AITRpodcast.com. I got links to social media like Twitter and Facebook, uh, show notes for every episode, including the games that Madison reviews, and a link over to Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month, you get twice the content and a million times more uh, swearing and weird, inappropriate topics. I think I, I stole some of your lines. I don't usually do the outro. I was just yeah. so overeager. But that has been All in the Reflexes. And again, I am Madison Matricula Roberts with Tech Guy Steve. And we'll see you over on There's a Problem with Your Face.